Hey everyone, welcome back to the FPL Scripts. This is Season 2, Episode 14, part of the F podcast series for the FPL 23-24 season. And we'll be looking at our Game Week 12 preview this week. But before we touch on that, just a quick review of Game Week 11. I'm your co-host, Fran, alongside my other co-host, Shadon Freudist. You'll find us on social media platforms. I am FPL underscore underscore Fran on X. Uh, this week was awful for me. I had 21 points, so clearly less than two points per player at one point i thought i had 22 points but you know it dawned on me that i had 21 which you know considering i have 13 effective players or 12 effective players was awful uh gordon being the only bright star of this game week where he didn't really i suppose deserve his goal a little bit debatable of course but we won't get into that and uh, i was at one point considering between gordon and archer because his expected value was actually really good as an archer's expected value was really good and we were probably expecting a start from him, but pr probably not a 90 minute outing, which is, mm. you know, a little bit of renewed confidence in terms of the effectiveness of Archer on our benches uh, for the future, I suppose. But I was also very fortunate to have Gordon, for example, shift into the center forward position. And to be honest, to touch on that as well, we know as well from the Champions League that Wilson has seemingly, you know, injured himself, or at least he has some sort of knock that might um, preclude him from participating in the Bournemouth fixture. But that, of course, is to remain unseen. And, of course, uh, Eddie Howe will probably not illuminate us any further. But Gordon could be, once again, someone who is strengthened by the X-Men's from a Premier League point of view of being able to play center forward for this fixture. And also, of course, he can play left wing and right wing. So right now looking like a great pick, but in the sea of uh, pretty poor Newcastle fixtures as well. So I do think that there is a little bit of sort of overrating of how good of a pick Gordon might be. Uh, I'm happy to own him, of course, and also especially happy to, to not own Morgan Gibbs White so far, at least. We'll see what happens. But yeah, I think he's a little bit overstated as a pick just because his underlying stats has, of course, been fantastic. But we know that Newcastle effectively have a have a sea of bad fixtures. And probably, you know, if we really, really rate Gordon, the next best time to actually buy him is probably something like Gaming 17. Yeah, it was really one of the worst weeks I've ever experienced in FPL. I ended up on 23 points uh, again less than two points per player if you consider captaincy as well. I had Maguire, uh, so he also got seven points like Gordon. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I played him over Gabriel because there was maybe, let's say, a one to two percent doubt on if he was going to start. I don't think he was never he was ever not going to start, but it's always good to get that confidence of, OK, he's going to start. And then there was this whole 90 minutes of he is concussed. Is he going to come off? Is he going to come off? And there was actually this moment around 59 minutes where the ref told him to go off the field because he was appearing to be dazed. And so those were, I think that was like one terrifying minute for me. But and even as a United fan, it wasn't great. And then he came on and he played 90. He played 90 even today in the Champions League game. So he's good. And I think that might turn out to be a shrewd, one of the only shrewd moves that I've made on wildcard. Because the other move that Review was telling me to do, for example, was to play Archer over Adingra this week. I didn't listen to Review and so Archer scored 9, obviously Adingra scored 2. But again, Adingra played the full 90, I think. So that's a good sign for things to come, hopefully. And hopefully he gets a rest in the Europa League game tomorrow. Yeah. Alright, so the first topic for this week is just defenders. And specifically defenders to transfer in this week, but also with, with a sort of view to... Um, specifically looking at fixtures game week 13 and game week 18 as well where we have the blank game week not only is that a blank game week but it's a a terrible time really for people who have invested into Simikas and Gabriel as of late or even other Arsenal defenders such as for example already owning Zinchenko and Saliba the issue of course is Liverpool play Arsenal on game week 18 and ultimately you know there, there is that blank game week as well so um, the best options I suppose that a lot of people have been really deliberating between have been either a Crystal Palace defender, probably Guehir Mitchell, uh, or let's say Castagne as well, who actually has probably definitively better fixtures in 13 and 18 in isolation, but isn't really good outside of that. Whereas, for example, Guehi is fantastic for this week mm. and this fixture. Uh, we've been talking off air as well, and I've been talking with people who also wildcarded card in, in game week 10. And because most of us have two free transfers, it's uh, make a transfer. But fortunately for us, I mean, it's not fortunate, but Burn got injured. So now we do have a transfer to make and I think burn to either a Crystal Palace defender or Castagna makes the most sense because there are two weeks where we definitely need to play defenders that are not technically part of our best 11 and those two fixture uh, game weeks as you already mentioned are game week 13 and game week 18. So for uh, if you consider only those two fixtures in isolation I think Castagna is probably the better choice but 
I'm also thinking about contingencies. Like, for example, if one of my other defenders gets benched and doesn't come on to play the game, for example, Gabriel or Simikas, I don't think it's going to happen with Simikas, but it could happen with Gabriel. I would much rather have prefer to have Gehi on the bench because uh, the EV that I would get, the expected value that I would get from that, as well as uh, the, the, the real points, I think, is likely to be better from someone like Gehi. And at 4.6, uh, guaranteed starts... Again, great XGC for Crystal Palace. I don't think it can go wrong. The other thing that we've talked about is Lewis Dunk. And while Estupinian is on the verge of coming back, uh, we might see him play in the Europa League game tomorrow. I still think that if we don't know his fitness level and if Deserby is not clear about that, I think Dunk is still a very viable option. And we've seen him, I think he has had the second most... I, I, I know, I don't subscribe to this statistic at all, but it is encouraging at the same time. So he's, I think, had the second most shots in the box for a defender. So Cash is, I think, the one who has obviously had the most shots because he also has the most XG. But I think Dunk is not that far behind him. He, I think he's been pretty good. Uh, if you also look at the goal that was disallowed, that he scored last week, you don't expect that from Dunk, but it's good to good that he has that in his locker. And he also takes direct set pieces as well. So that's also something that we can consider when, when uh, looking at Louis Dunk. Uh, there are other options that we also uh, were looking at. So, for example, City Defence. I think... A lot of people are looking to sort of either commit to free hit 18 or still maybe try to see if they can hang on to a few for a few more weeks and until they have to commit and i think if you go for someone like gehi because gehi plays brighton in 18 i think you are sort of committing to free hit 18 because you would rather have other defenders so for example i think aston villa is one of the defenses that you would want to have and if the plan for people is to go let's say cash to estupinian in game week 12 because um, Brighton have better fixtures than Aston Villa, then in that case, I would think that Gehi is just another step towards that. So, City Defender is even further of a step, I would say, towards free Tate team because they definitely don't play in that week. And other than Walker, none of them are nailed as well. And we spoke last week about Walker as well. So, do you think there's anyone else worth considering in that City Defense? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably defaulting back into Ruben Diaz, but. At that sort of price point, I'd rather just mess with Walker's um, minutes, just because it seems like Walker is just as nailed as him, if, if not more nailed, you know, as it's turned out so far this season. Particular, since we sort of see we see Walker effectively holding with for this City team, um, and he actually has like underlying stats this season. You know, it's things that already sort of make him a little bit better than, for example just purely going for Ruben for nailedness. And, and also, I think we discussed this that uh, Akanji and uh, John Stones suffering injuries will only bolster the mints of the defenders that are available. Mm -hmm. To what degree, we still don't know. But I think Walker being nailed as it is in the Premier League games, at least, you said that he's played every single minute, yeah, right? Yeah, 990. Yeah. In the, yeah, that's insane. No, no one would have expected that at the start of the season from someone like Walker. So if that is the case and we expect that to continue, I think committing to Walker is not a bad strategy, but then it kind of does lock you into free hit 18. Either that or then you have to play a very thin squad in game week 18 and hope that none of your players are rotated or injured because it is also a busy time of the season. So there's that. So there are definitely a few things to consider when it comes to defenders and uh, transfers out. Because I think that's probably the biggest area of concern for everyone right now. Because game week 13 is a really bad week for defenses all around because City play Liverpool. So all of us are looking for options to make sure that our game week 13 defense is okay. And then ultimately our game week 18 defense and further ahead as well. So maybe consider some of these things before making a transfer. Yeah. The only other thing or, or sort of pick that I'd mention is probably... Livermento, just because I, I think hmm. when we talk about let's say Newcastle defense, a lot of people will be first thinking about Lascelles. But I suppose by by game week eighteen, if you're really lo looking for a pick that actually might serve you there as well, the issue with Lascelles is probably by game week eighteen. I'd assume hopefully that Botman would be back because that's you know effectively two two months away, and I mean you're sort of looking at um, Livermento as someone who could actually last a bit longer as a pick if he actually seems to nail down, for example, that left back starting spot or at least, you know, the alternating spot where he plays right back. And um, just touching on Livermento, for example, um, because of Dan Burns' long term sort of spinal injury, that just means if, let's say, Bottom was to come back into the team, I think Lascelles just loses his spot by default. Whereas with Livermento, that sort of that punt could still last quite long but i think even in the short term what we've seen so far this season is livermento and three outings has effectively been swapped to the left so 
I think that sort of increases expense. I know um, I, I've had some sort of disagreements with some other people who, who don't feel the same, but the way I see it is obviously if you're sort of trying to maximize, let's say, Trippier as a coach potentially, and you think he should always play right back, it's nice to see that Livermento can also play left back whenever you want mm. um, for Eddie Howe. Mm. So that, that doesn't really, for example, hurt, let's say, Livermento if you suddenly need Trippier at his best for whatever reason. So you're sort of looking at Livermento as, as a pretty good sort of medium to long term punt. Yeah, and I think the price is very important because price was also a consideration when I went for someone like Maguire because mm. he was 4.2. Yeah. And I think it's the same logic, but he plays for a much better defense as well. I agree that now, because Evans got injured today, Maguire's minutes are almost secure now that he's going to play 90 every week. But let's say two weeks before, I would say, argue that Maguire's minutes were not too far off someone like Liveramento's minutes are today. So it's not going to take long for Liveramento to play 60 to 70 minutes every week and also midweek because they don't have a lot of options as we've already mentioned. Luis Hall is probably the only other option that they have because Target also got injured and Target is, is injured for two months now from what I saw. So it's really a lack of options that is going to force them to keep playing the same players over and over and that is good from an FPL perspective uh, as far as I can tell. Makes sense. And just on defenders once again, Obviously, for this week in particular, in game week 12, as a priority transfer, I think a lot of people will probably be looking at either doubling up on Arsenal defense or, you know, investing into their first Arsenal defender. And, and probably it's a, it's a good time to sort of rerun that Arsenal priority list in terms of defense. Um, how would you go about sort of ranking the Arsenal defenders? It is with a very heavy heart that I have to put Saliba first because I sold him on the wildcard 10. It's one of my worst decisions that I've made this season. He is nailed every single game, 90 minutes. He can be partnered with anyone ranging from Kivior to Ben White to Gabriel, but he is going to play every single game. I guess the fear of his injury being managed somehow got to me, I think. And also him being 0.5 more expensive than Gabriel was also a factor, definitely. But now that we've seen that he is the only one who's going to play every single game, I would definitely rate him as the top defender. And I, the order would, I think, be Saliba, Ben White and then Gabriel. Because... Uh, ben White, even though he's much more expensive than Saliba, is still probably nailed to play every single week. I think the only week that he was benched for was the Lons 2 all draw, if I remember correctly, in the Champions League. That was, I think, the only game for which he was benched. So other than that, it's pretty good for x as well as far as Ben White is concerned. And I know that we I didn't mention Zinchenko, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, what do you think about someone like Zinchenko? Yeah, I think with Zinchenko, it's tough because I think Tommy Asso has obviously stepped up and actually grabs a lot of minutes on that sort of left back mm. position. So maybe a lot of people will be thinking, let's say Zinchenko should be playing most of the fixtures where Arsenal can sort of be a little bit more ball dominant and, and control the game really just from sort of free flowing passing. But uh, yeah, that's the concern, right? Of course, Zinchenko is like a knife's edge because not only is he someone who can actually pl be the best sort of baseline bonus baseline player for Arsenal, the issue I suppose is he's always playing towards let's say a 59 minute substitution in my opinion. Whereas mm -hmm. for example, let's say, okay, if you if you get the minutes wrong for Gabriel, more often than not, he's going to be 0 or 90. Whereas for Zinchenko, I think even though it's very lovely and the upside's quite high, um, yeah, I mean, there are going to be games where maybe if he's a bit ineffectual, he can be prone to an early substitution, which I, I, don't, I, I don't think, for example, Gabriel is. So I think there's there's that sort of added risk to Zinchenko where things can go wrong, even though on paper, of course, it seems like he'll play some of these nice fixtures. Uh, so that's the only thing I, I would say to add caution to Zinchenko. And part of that, as I said, is just due to Tomiyasu. I suppose White also has a propensity to have that sort of early substitution, but it's it's very rare with him. Um, hmm. I can only remember a few instances where White was an early sub. For example, versus Rashford last season when he was getting cooked. Also earlier last week as well, a, a little bit of an early substitution for Ben White. And that, that doesn't happen too often. But for Zinchenko, I think we've seen it already enough. And because Tomiyasu is now right there, um, I think that's a concern with Zinchenko for me. Yeah, and even um, if ever someone needed evidence that an early -ish sub for a defender is not a good thing, I think Cash is the perfect example where you saw a preview with him getting subbed favorably to get a clean sheet for all of us that owned him and then Aston Villa conceding. But then the very next week, that uh, substitution got extended mm. bit further ahead into the game. And as a result, he didn't even get the two points that you get for 60 minutes. Yeah. So if something like that, you feel like so a player has a propensity for that, you have to consider both sides. So you can bank a clean sheet, sure, but also you can easily... 
have a defender being subbed before the 60th minute. And uh, the other reason we are talking specifically about Arsenal defense is normally I would have subscribed to doubling up on their attack given the fixtures that they have. But because their XG, I was looking at their XG and it's their 7th on XG right now. And again, fixture adjusted, maybe they could be a little bit higher. But right now on just pure XG, they are 7th. And on XGC, they are 2nd and just behind Man City. And that just shows, and even in the Champions League today, you could see that, that their defense is incredible. And if that is the case, then I would much rather pr- prefer to double up on their defense rather than double up on their attack. And so for me right now, if I were looking at the first three picks that I would take from Arsenal, given that I already have Gabriel and uh, Saka, I would go for uh, Saliba, Gabriel and Saka. I, I agree with that. It's a very simple yeah. decision. And, and part of that too really is, even though you have so many injuries in the attacking positions, it doesn't necessarily reinforce the minutes of any of the key picks in the midfield position. And yeah. with the forward position, I mean, you've got two issues now, I suppose, with Enkedio even suffering a knock himself this week. So it's not good uh the minutes are still very dicey for most players and yeah just to add on to for example a little bit of that fire for arsenal uh and their attack i mean they've received six penalties this season the most of any other team so when you contextualize that xg by penalties oh, as well they've been that's a great point. very very poor yes. really compared to yes. what we would expect of arsenal as a team mm. um you know so i believe the second most penalties was is four received by liverpool and chelsea so mm. Yeah, that's actually a lot of added context that I think it's it's worth reacting to. And ultimately, their their defense has only really improved with Rice. And even from like a, it's a grassy oh, point of uh, view, you can just sorry. say... One thing I forgot to add was the fact that we have so many dicey picks right now in our team. So, for mm-hmm. example, Gabriel and Simikas. And there are so many picks right now that uh, cash, even I, uh, cash is borderline dicey. Yeah. So I would say that if that's the case, uh, getting someone like Saliba who is nailed on for 90 minutes is, I think, a really great thing for the team. Because you know that whatever else happens in your team, there's one player that is definitely going to play unless he gets injured. So in a meta where most of the players and most of the teams just to save money are going for all these budget options who may or may not be nailed. I think getting someone like Saliba, who is not that expensive, I think 5.2 is nothing in, in the grand scheme of things, is I think a really good investment uh, for the long term. But uh, yeah, so sorry to cut you off if you uh, want to... No, yeah, yeah, that makes about. sense. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say that Rice obviously adds a lot to to the Arsenal team and it, it's already borne out, as you said, yeah. with the underlying stats. So, so the next thing I think we uh, were going to touch on is uh, burning a free transfer. I think there are a lot of teams that have two free transfers and... Not really much to do this week, so it's either a question of burn a free transfer or make a slightly sideways move that might benefit you later down the line when you maybe need to play them. But technically speaking, they are probably a nailed spot on your bench. So I think goalkeepers is probably the big thing, one big thing that we uh, noticed this week. For example, Turner lost his place. And we always knew that was going to happen somewhere down the line because Vlako Dimas is Benfica's number one goalkeeper and there was no way he was going to just be a second fiddle. So that has happened now and I'm glad it happened after he gifted Salah a goal. So at least we got that out of his captaincy rather than just a blank. Uh, but now that that has happened, do you think that a sideways move from Turner to let's say someone like uh, Flecken, Raya or Strakosha makes sense? Yeah, I think eventually you, you're just saving a transfer, right? Because Flecken is probably a suggested move close to when, you know, Brentford's fixture swing, even as soon as 14. So to fast forward it for two weeks makes sense. All you need to do is make sure that Flecken's fine. Because I think, of course, a 45 minute substitution is a little weird. Not not too mm. often that a keeper has a dead leg, I suppose. Um, and he's already struggled a little bit this season to, to get those minutes um, when you sort of need him to play. But yeah, other, I mean, if it seems like he gets the all clear, then Flecken's probably the best pick. Otherwise, you've just got Raya or probably even just, maybe maybe you could consider Johnson as well. I think he's still a very good standout oh, that's keeper. that's a good shout. Yeah, um, that's a good shout, actually. Yeah. Or just the 3.9 at that point. I think those are really the only three keepers I would consider moving to in the context that we always have Areola as a backup option. I think the, one, the other big thing that happened is obviously Madison going off before halftime. But again, it didn't seem that serious on the face of it. And I think even Ange said in his post-match interview that he took him off because they were already down and he just wanted to make sure that he has uh, other personnel involved in the game. But let's say Madison is ruled out for two to three weeks. What would you uh, look at? Like, What would your uh, preferences be? Yeah, I think uh, it would be Matoma or Eze. 
um, this week. Matoma, as we've said time and time again, not exactly really backed by review, but actually if you, for example, shorten your horizon to, let's say, four to five game weeks and sort of, you know, stop caring about things like the Asian Cup, he is actually quite a good short-term pick. Mm. This is the reality of good Brighton fixtures. So I think Matoma is obviously definitely one option. And then otherwise, obviously, probably our, the, the most favorite sort of review pick, um, the one who ticks every single box possibly, um, and is basically like a B tier and, and Bumo, which would be Eze. Yeah. yeah, those two picks probably would be the ones I like. I'm just, are, are you concerned at all about, let's say, um, Roy Hodgson, for example, easing Eze in, or do you think we're going to see him start as soon as this week? That's actually a good point. If I were to use the, the normal philosophy I, I apply to any player that is coming back from injury, I would still wait for a week or two. Mm-hmm. But given that Crystal Palace have a real dearth of attacking players, and the reason I, I think that he might already start next week and play a lot of minutes is because he already has been eased in the last week. Yeah. So normally I would think that last week I would have thought that it would be a short, even a shorter cameo. Then he would probably build up his minutes and then probably a start. But the fact that he's already played a lot of minutes last week makes me think that I think a start is probably inevitable this week. And as long as he can stay fit, I, as you've already pointed out, I think calling someone a B tier and Bumo is the highest praise they can get for their tier. Because obviously you can be an A tier and Bumo, which is M Bumo himself. But as far as B tier players go, I think, yeah, that's the, probably the highest praise you can uh, get this season. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, I'm gonna have to correct that. Obviously, if if Mbumo is S tier, which he is, um, so maybe oh, yeah, as yeah, yeah. is is, is <laughs> yeah. actually in the A tier. I apologize. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So the last topic of the week is always going to be captaincy. This is a week where Holland is nowhere to be seen. Even if you adjust his minutes um, to ninety, which seems to be the case, it seems like he's going to be ready yeah. for that Chelsea game. Um, we've got three options. Um, do you want to take us through them? Absolutely. I think uh, it's. Not of any surprise that Salah is the number one option as per review this week. And he is followed by Saka and Bruno Fernandes. Now again, Saka went off with a slight knock. So maybe look out for, I mean, Arteta is notorious for not letting you know anything. But uh, from what he said after the game, he's probably fine. And I would put Saka's minutes at 80-ish because I assume that they'll thrash Burnley regardless. And Mm. then that also means that Saka is likely to... Uh, be subbed off so at around maybe 80 or 78 or something like that so I would put his minutes around that and Bruno obviously 95 uh, there's uh, no one else who's going to play so if you I I think if uh, also about Holland because I think we didn't mention Holland at all in the rest of the uh, podcast so just so that everyone knows Holland already played 60 minutes in the Champions League game he scored two goals and was subbed off to preserve him so he is perfectly fine for the weekend and uh, all of us expect him to start so no need to worry about transferring him out in any case but what do you think Uh, do you think there's anyone else that kind of stands out or what do you think between Saka and Salah because uh, neither of us own Bruno I guess obviously we probably won't be dabbling into it but you know, on theory, this is, I'm sorry, in theory, I suppose Matoma, Watkins, and Gordon are some of the popular options I've actually seen. A um, little bit out really? there, definitely oh. with Gordon. Um, but yeah, these are the picks that I've seen have been touted, uh, along with, mm. of course, Holland. But I mean, the EV of these players, it's 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 not even remotely close. Um, even Rashford, for example, probably might have better EV. Um, yeah, but, no. yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. it's tough. I mean, Salah, I think, is such a clear pick. He's at home. Uh, once again, so nothing really to do here. I think this is uh, one of those weeks where I'm not going to overthink at all. I think Salah at home uh, against a good team, but also not impregnable. So I think it's like the perfect combination. Maybe, well, not maybe the perfect, but it's the best combination out of what we have this week. Yeah, and, and I think that's just how we have to end it. It's Chelsea away for Holland, so there's nothing really to debate. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, uh, that's the end of this podcast. Uh, If you enjoyed, please, if you're listening to us on podcast, rate us uh, five stars, share it, you know, on YouTube, like, subscribe, whatever you need to do to get the podcast out. Ever since we did the Andy episode, I think uh, we've been really happy with the reception we got on that episode and the subsequent episodes. Uh, We've seen that uh, on average, 80% of the people that watch the podcast don't subscribe to it. So let's get that number slightly up. And hopefully everyone has a good game week. See you next week.